explicit learning on, on a cell phone. And, and also to the schools, I know in my children's schools, they don't allow cell phones to be used. They have to be turned off until they leave the school. They can have them with them, but you know, in case parents want to get in touch with the children after school. Um, would it be helpful for school districts to maybe have a policy where Most they don't use do. them other than outside before or after school, away from school property? Yeah, most of them do have that policy. Um, the problem is that kids don't always follow the rules. Sure. Okay, so you end up with a situation, and one that I ran into, where um, the bullying started outside of school. The kids ended up texting each other from room to room in a bullying situation. One girl was definitely being bullied by the other girl. They get into a fight outside the bathroom. They both get the same punishment. Um, and if it's just the punishment, there's no education happening there. So if we just bring them in and say, you're out for this many days and you lose all those points and everything, that misses the education portion of it uh, and the what you do. And while we have those policies, kids don't always follow them, you know? And they don't have the cell phone off. And most of the time, most of the time when they don't have a cell phone off, it's mom calling <laughs> that we're dealing with or mom texting them. Uh, and a lot of times, mom's thinking, well, they have a cell phone off, so they're always surprised when they get an answer back. You also have a situation where you have parents who are not as technology astute as the students. And while you're describing the perfect situation, if we have parents who have not been raised with the technology, are not computer literate, uh, are not cell phone literate, then even though those policies exist and we'd like to have that reinforced at home, it's very difficult to do. And whether we like it or not, teachers and administrators need to step in sometimes and fill in those little holes. And, and the earlier they can do it, the better. It's not in every class curriculum, though. Are there blocks like firewalls and things on school computers for children? There are, and that is required by the state in order to, to have the internet there, so they are there. Kids know how to get around them. There is something known as a proxy. They are in the millions, and you know, so they can get around them occasionally. Um, we do our best, but I teach a computer course. It's not always easy. You know, and so we have to a lot of times have the discussion. The other thing the kids are not aware of, and this is, you know, if you think back to being a teenager, you knew how the world ran outside of that building. You knew what adults did. You knew. Um, they don't, and they don't realize that, you know, one of the things I ran last year was uh, a photo of all the cell phones. You know, we went and looked at all the cell phones that have to be turned in before they go into a meeting at the White House. You know, so don't tell me that I can't take your cell phone if I need to. I'm not allowed to look through it. I wouldn't want to. But I'm allowed to take the cell phone in order to maintain control of my brain. I have a different kind of question. Um, if you have what is the correct policy, in your opinion, on putting the student newspaper online? Actually, that's something that uh, the Supreme Court has addressed a related issue. And there was a, it's mentioned actually in the letter in your packet, schools can place limits on school-sponsored student speech. School newspapers are an example of that. There was a Supreme Court case back in 1988 that said that schools can limit the speech with any school-sponsored student newspaper. Um, and that would include publishing decisions. Um, how many copies are published, where it's circulated, if it's online, if it's online but only students can access it. That would fall within what the court said a school can regulate. I, I do want to add an editorial here, though. Although that case was called Basically, um, it was considered a huge step backwards yes. in civil liberties. And the student free speech in this country through history. Did you not say that? Sorry. Um, throughout our history, student free speech has been an important component of civic discourse. And when the Supreme Court gave schools the right to censor the student newspaper, we feel like 
it was a huge step backwards for the future of free speech in the whole country. Because now we're training kids to this idea that authority can limit the breadth of your speech quite severely. And what we've seen in the censorship complaints that we get from kids, the school's not censoring the vulgar or the rude. What they're censoring is the political and the controversial. So the kids who did a fabulous story about unwed teen pregnancy in their high school, that story was censored because it reflected badly on the high school. Really bad message for schools, but it is the state of the law. We don't like it or agree with it. Does it follow then that there is no, schools can't control the content, that uh, they are somehow immune from libel and slander suits? I don't or, know. Or if they're going to have free content, then as publisher, maybe sue? Would you charge you that? I don't know. I'll ask one of the lawyers. What do you think? That's, that's way outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting we question. We can't ask questions when we don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> we can look it up for you. How's that? What about this? Uh, if students take that newspaper home and scan it on their computer, and they put it out on their computer, either on a blog or on a website, What's the limit on that? You mean like the fabulous, like the fabulous papers, maybe? Yeah. Uh, anonymous press, free press, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to control. I, I know the issues come up with the law, but I mean, it, 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 there's probably, you know, at least some, some argument for fair use. Um, you know, uh, I think Twitter is a good example. You know, I might find a really good article on some issue that I'm interested in, and I'll, I'll write, you know, a two or three sentence, you know, hey, look at this because, then I'll zap in, you know, whatever media outlet's website is, but I'm citing that article directly. It's a, technically, I guess I'm republishing the URL for the article, um, but I'm adding my own commentary to it. Um, and so probably adding my own commentary to it puts it within the realm of fair use and takes it outside of a, a copyright context. Um, and it leaves me squarely within a, a legitimate First Amendment context. Um, as far as libel and slander, I mean, that's, that's outside my, my areas of, of, of knowledge, really, um, in a law. But I think it would be incredibly creative and, frankly, possibly even a novel case if you had a student who wanted to try to do that, essentially be the, the ghost publisher of the student newspaper online through uh, scanning and, and posting, um, and and I think that would really test the limits of where we are um, as far as First Amendment jurisprudence online goes. Um, and and I think it'd be very very interesting to see how the school would react and, and to see you know, how the courts would react if it ever got that far. Actually, I'm going to add to that point. Brian's right. This really is an evolving area of the law. And to give you another example of a very current issue that's been in the news this week along these lines um, in terms of whether this falls within fair use or not. There's a big debate right now within college football, NCAA football, and including the Big Ten, about whether people sitting inside the stadium can Twitter and can sit there while they're watching a football game and say, oh man, they just blew this, or oh, they scored, and giving the play-by-play -play because under the contracts that these uh, football franchises have with, um, I believe it's ESPN or, or ABC, one of these, um, they have the exclusive broadcast rights to that game. And there's a huge debate right now within NCAA football whether or not they can have a ban inside the stadium on uh, people who are sitting in the stands uh, posting on Twitter or Facebook or MySpace or any of these and all the discussion has been, no one knows. No one knows if that's fair use, if that's a copyright violation. No one knows how to treat it. So it really is an evolving area of the law that's coming up in a variety of contexts. And we, we may have an answer sometime, but not very soon. Carrie, how would they distinguish between that uh, Twitter and calling on your cell phone, right? And Telling somebody. Anymore, it's really the same technology. It, the same concept, except when you're calling a person on the phone, it's a one-to-one -one communication. But if it's on Twitter, it's distribution. I have a question and a comment. Uh, the comment